Hello, good evening and welcome to your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. This is Business Focus. On this platform, we discuss everything that concerns your business and more. Tonight, we'll be delving deep into uh, some of the major business stories that have been making headlines uh, throughout the week. It promises to be interesting and exciting as we delve deeper into the reduction in benchmark values at the ports as well as matters arising. Well, later on the program tonight, we'll also go for the Mover segment where we tell you what young entrepreneurs are doing to contribute uh, to the country's gross domestic product. Later on the program, also we'll bring the very latest on the uh, commodities market as well as the stock market. Market. We'll find out what the price of cocoa, gold and oil is and how they are likely to impact on the local economy. This is Business Focus. We'll take a short break, but we'll start up with uh, some feedback on business. So you're welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. Let's, get, let's go for some tips on how to maximize feedback from your customers as a new startup. All right, so welcome back to Business Focus. My name is Park Wissiasari. Uh, this is your most authoritative business and economic analysis program, li analysis program life here on TV3. So we're going to start off uh, with an issue which has to do with the benchmark values. And as you may be aware, uh, Vice President Dr. Uh, Mohamedou Baumia has announced a 50% reduction in import benchmark values at the country's ports and a 30% uh, reduction for vehicles. Now, the directive which took effect on Thursday, April 4, was announced on Wednesday, April 3, at a town hall meeting organized by the Economic Management Team. Well, this decision follows calls uh, from groups like the Ghana Union of Traders Association to review the high taxes and duties on imported items. Uh, listen to Dr. Baumia uh, as he made that announcement. The move, according to Dr. Baumia, is to ensure an increase in the volume of imports through the country's ports instead of through neighboring countries. It is also to make Ghana's ports competitive. Container volumes in Lome port between 2013 and 2018 have gone up by 300 percent. Annually, Ghana, between 2013 and 2016, container volumes have increased by 4.1 percent. So there's so much of these container volumes, and when you go to the Lomi port, you see a long lineup of trucks coming into Ghana. So because of this, cabinet, after considering all of of this has decided to implement some new reforms at the port. Cabinet is making these, these reforms with the objective of increasing trade facilitation and efficiency and revenue. Port revenue depends on volume. 
So we are looking at increasing revenue. But to do so, we cannot be uncompetitive between Ghana and our next door neighbors. That, would, that is just shooting ourselves in the foot. So, to reduce the incidence of smuggling and enhance revenue, the benchmark delivery values of imports will be reduced by 50%. However, for vehicles, the reduction will be 30%. This is because vehicles already attract an amount of depreciation, which if you factor it in, it will take you closer to the 50%. This will be effective from tomorrow. The Vice President said the fiscal inspection of containers has also been identified as one of the major disincentives in the port operations in the country. Well, uh, after the announcement by the Vice President, there have been several concerns raised by the, uh, on the directive with especially the Association of Ghana Industries saying that almost 90% of imported goods at the ports are not part of the benchmark value. Well, according to the CEO of the Association of Ghana Industries, Sir Chuma Kwaba, most people have misunderstood that announcement made by the Vice President that there will be a 50% reduction on import duty as well as a 30% for cars. Now, others have also condemned the 50% flat rate reduction for all goods arguing that it will affect the local producer and have a long-term effect on our ability as a country to export. Uh, joining me in studio uh, this afternoon to discuss this directive as well as other matters is the board chairman of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, uh, Mr. Sandy Oseajimai. Thank you very much sir for your time and good to have you on the program. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. So uh, you are the chairman of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority. That's correct. Tell us what's your mandate? Well, our mandate is to promote export from Ghana, mm. basically, you know, whatever it takes. And this will be the non-traditional exports. This will include everything except cocoa and gold. Mm. So anything that is anything that's done in Ghana, from all their agri products, from their cosmetic products, from their um, horticultural products, from the handicap product. Uh, I'm afraid we've got to hold it here. I'm told there's a difficulty with your microphone. Okay. We'll take a short break. You're watching Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis mm -hmm. program live here on TV3. We're also streaming live on Facebook. I've got the uh, chairman of the uh, Ghana Export Promotion Authority, Mr. Sandy Osei, in uh, Sandy in with me in studio. We'll take a short break and we'll return uh, to him uh, to do some more analysis on this program. All right, so you're welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. My guest in the studio tonight is the chairman of the Ghana um, Export Promotion Authority, Mr. Sandy Oseajima, and he is my guest in the studio tonight. Uh, let me say a big thank you to, to you once again. And you're just telling us about the mandate of the Ghana Well, Project. our mandate is to promote anything that is produced in Ghana and is exportable. Mm. So other than the, tra the, the non-traditional, we call it. Mm. Uh, that means everything except oil, gold, and uh, cocoa. So this this is what we're supposed to try to promote outside to bring in more um, foreign currency to Ghana. And how competitive would you say our uh, export have been? It hasn't been that great, but um, because over the last years it's been basically flat. I think last year we exported about 2.5 billion. And I think our import was almost double that. So. There's a plan in place that we... Our imports was almost double our exports. Yeah, but yes. Mm. So there's a plan in place for us to try to promote. And we, as GEP, have a three-year plan. We want to be able to see what we can do to bring the export to about $5 billion over the next three years. What's been the difficulty over the years? Everything. Um, we can't produce enough okay, as a nation. Uh, we don't have the resources to produce enough. Um, sometimes you have goods people want but because we don't produce enough we can export so it's been the overall challenge of a, as a country that um, I need to be more productive in what we do to make things to manufacture things I've been lacking so unless we bring our focus into place and manufacture more it doesn't matter what it is we manufacture more then we'll be all right and I say this because I take a, I take a look at a place like United States about 80 percent of what they produce is consumed there so if you produce more in your country, then you can have access to export. But because we don't produce enough, everything is important. But, but we know this. We've always known this. The challenge yeah. has been to implement it. We yes. know we don't produce a lot more than we don't produce as much as we need. Mm -hmm. And so why are we not doing it? Well, I, I guess it's a, 
I don't know if it's a leadership or structure or the Ghanaian mentality or whatever. We've grown used to this imported things because it's easier. And I think not until we can build our industrial base where we actually manufacture more, that problem will still exist. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a change in attitude as a country to support, first, to support what is made here. Okay, if we support what is made here, then there will be incentive for the people that make them to make more. But because it's so easier to import things and bring it here, the tendency is to neglect what we do here. We we'll first need to produce enough to consume ourselves before we can export. Yes, there's a saying in export that you can't export till you produce excess. You export the excess. Mm. We don't even make enough to feed ourselves. So how can we export? That's another way of putting it. Mm. So unless we get into this mindset that we're going to be a manufacturing country, we're going to produce more whatever we do, we continue to have Quite this apart challenge. from, I mean, producing what we have to produce in terms of the standards of, of the goods that we set out, do they meet international standards? Yeah, most of us, most of it that do goods meet international standards. Mm. Uh, you can satisfy yourself and be able to export it anywhere. A good example is, for example, I know a situation where a company wanted to buy a lot from Ghana, but their concern is, if I give you the other, can you meet it? 90% of the time, we can. It can take any commodity from textile, from, let's say, shea butter, from just about anything. Even, even cocoa. We don't even produce enough as a country. So the local uh, cocoa processing companies in Ghana have a hard time trying to get enough products to produce. So I think what we need to do as a country is to find a way that our focus is going to be to manufacture more, whatever it takes. With this benchmark reduction, yeah, it's good. It will solve some problems, but we have to look at the other side of the coin. What incentive can we give to yeah, the And that's exporters? where I'm going to go next. Uh, so last week, there was a town hall meeting addressed by the Vice President, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mahmoud Bamiya, uh, where he made uh, quite um, an audacious announcement uh, about a reduction in the benchmark values for imports. We saw a lot of importers excited about that move. What's your own, uh, <coughs> what's your own impression of that? I think it's a great idea. Let me, uh, I'd like to be practical about it. Let's say, in my particular case, let's say I import raw materials to do what I do. Okay, in the past, say I'm paying, if, I, if my goods is 100,000, my raw material value is $100,000. And then the benchmark that they had there was $100,000. When it comes, my net duty mostly is around 42%. When you add all the different tariffs, comes to about 42 percent. Now, if the benchmark is going to reduce to 50,000, okay, the net effect is that my duty should reduce, based using the same tariff numbers, should reduce to about, about 20, half of it. So that's cash flow that is released for you, for help you in so many ways. Now you can be price competitive. Not only can you be price competitive, you'll be able to bring in more goods, cause, and then your price to the marketplace Will be reduced not necessarily well not okay. necessarily because okay. uh, you know over here what we see is that the the importer benefits mm -hmm. but the final consumer is not likely to benefit well then the ones that will decide to reduce their prices will take the market isn't it mm. if we're bringing the same quality goods together mm. and my prices is cheaper because i'm passing on the savings from the port to the consumer mm. and my price is cheaper don't you think people will come to me and buy mine because I have the same I, I think so, but prices hardly reduce in this part of the world. You know that, and I well, know that. We, we both know that. <laughs> we see the challenges we face is so many, mm. many multifaceted. We have challenges with the currency depreciation. Mm. Okay. We have challenges with all, ev just about everything. This benchmark is only one part to help solve some of the problems. It won't be cure or do all. Okay, so even if prices don't go down, at least the port vo volume will increase. And the way that I'm also looking at it is that the tendency for people to cheat mm. might go down. You mm. know, most people will just try to undervalue their invoices coming in. And that's, that's why they, this whole benchmark has yes, to come because in. Yes, mm. and it's real, because if your cost of production is so high, mm. okay, your, your gross margins most of the time... So, for mm. instance, an importer goes to buy a vehicle for about $5,000 mm -hmm. and then, you know, comes, brings a good in and undervalues it to yes. about... So look, let's say I bought it for two thousand mm -hmm. because they want to pay cheaper, uh, you know, taxes, and mm -hmm. that's how come we have to do this benchmark yes. so that you know the manufacturer's price and you peg it by the manufacturer's price. Okay. Unfortunately, that's what's leading to high costs of, of the goods. Well, well, do they really peg it to manufacturer prices? The government have their own way of doing it, right? And sometimes 
people will give you the true values, but mm. the benchmark gets to be a little bit higher right. than the real value. Well, that's good for governments. If it's but higher. it's not good for the businessman. Absolutely. You know, so this is another way of trying to, if we say our attitude these days is to promote business, mm. and this is one step of doing it. But, mm -hmm. but if the importer is going to benefit at the end of the day, what about government? I mean, government has made its own projections with okay. regards to revenue. Okay. Certainly, there's going to be a shortfall. <laughs> not really. Let me, let me put okay. it this way. You understand the multiply effect of money. Let's mm. say this policy by itself is going to put, say, one billion Ghana CDs into the system because the, the importers are saving this. Mm. The savings still stay here in Ghana to do more economic activities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the government will still get its money one way or the other. You can pay it through VAT, through the other means that uh, make money, corporate taxes and all of that. Because now you're able to increase your your own business, your volume will go up, your sales will go up. So government will gain from that end. Not only that. Is it, is it, a, is it a short term gain? It could be a long term gain. This so is in the, the interim? In the interim, in the interim is to help local businesses to quote unquote stabilize their business. See, I, I counter this with, uh, with the depreciation of the city. Mm. If the city is depreciation so fast mm. and you pay all these high taxes, mm. then you're getting triple the trouble. Mm. So by this way, at least you say, okay, I know the city is not doing so well and I'm reducing your taxes just so I can counter the effect of the city depreciation. Mm. That's another way of looking at it. I'm saying to you that, mm. for instance, government has projected a, um, a revenue of, let's say, 52 billion and mm. it factored in all the ports, revenue is going to make from the ports and all that. You've come up with a policy now, mm. reducing the benchmark values of, of, of imports. Certainly, you, you can't realize the amount that you had budgeted. So what's going to make for the but shortfall? You, you, you know, you heard the axiom that high volume, low margins. Yeah, but, right? the, yeah, but the high volumes are, are not in the short term. Well, high volumes could be short term to long term, medium term, doesn't matter. Mm. But let's say, you know, you know they were complaining that the uh, containers coming through the port mm. has gone down mm. tremendously. Mm. Why? Because they were finding their way to Ivory Coast, to uh, Togo and right, all of that. Right. Now, assuming all these containers were coming out, mm. even though they do... Because but it's not going to be automatic. Oh, it's, well, you're not going to leave it, a free it, port it, it, to come to another port. It will be because mm. there's advantage. If you're based in Ghana doing your business here, mm. what sense does it make to ship your stuff to Togo and go through all the transportation costs and the hassle of trying to bring it back to Ghana mm. and all the d challenges you face? If my prices are competitive, why don't I bring everything here, cut everything short and be able to work? Mm. So, so by doing this, now we're going to stay competitive anyway because mm. there won't be any need for me, so, for so, example. So you're looking at it from a point of, let's say, economies of scale, so that mm -hmm. once you reduce the prices, you're going to have volumes increase, yes. which it, is going to bring you more revenue. Yes. But again, I say to you that it's going to be a long term. It doesn't matter if it takes a, a year, two years, mm. but you can't do things for short term. You have to do it in medium, long term. Mm. You know, that's sometimes the challenge we have here in this country. Mm. Everybody wants... Uh, uh, they, uh, they want things quicker, quicker. But, you know, this is a policy, if it's sustained, will improve overall business, cost of business will go down. Mm -hmm. More business will be enticed to come out here. Mm -hmm. I was reading on the net uh, that April 4th, the gentleman has said that uh, he brought the same car here mm -hmm. some time back. Uh, he paid 31000 in duties. Mm -hmm. On April 4th, the same car, the same spec came out, he paid 18000 mm -hmm. So that means if you bring it here and they say the spare part people are able to bring it here, mm -hmm. they will bring more parts. So mm -hmm. you will bring newer, better cars to serve what the purpose here rather than just go buy the cheaper cars because it's too expensive. I'm going to go on the phone line quickly to speak to Joseph Amenio. He's a public relations officer of the Ghana House of Ports agent. He's also an importer. But just before I go to him, uh, he's actually an agent. Before I go to him on the phone lines, um, th there's some who have also expressed the concern that with this latest reduction in benchmark uh, values, we're going to see a lot more imports. Yes, uh, the import will increase. But then, remember I said there's a counter to this. Mm. We have to look at the exporters too. What do we do to, for example, I'm concerned about the amount of rice we import into this country. Mm. So if I'm doing something like this, then maybe I might have to, if I, I would suggest that, why don't we look at what we can do to help the people that make things here that we use the most, mm. better way to produce. For example, if I'm doing rice and we need 100 million, we import what, 700, 1 billion dollars of worth of rice, whatever mm. it is. Mm. Why couldn't we find, say, 100 million dollars mm. to give to the, all the rice importers one way or the other mm. for them to increase the, the production of rice? And then ultimately, it, perhaps, uh, increase the tariff on rice imports? It, or ultimately mm. ban import of rice. Mm. Which is going to be a long-term measure, really. 
What's long term? Mm. I mean, we've been doing the same thing all these years. So mm. if we do something that would take two, three years to, to bring out the results, that's mm. how it's You done. think it's doable? It's very doable. It's very doable in the sense that the rice manufacturer, they make quality rice. So why can't we invest that whatever money it takes, mm. okay, mm. in that particular mm. I'll industry. come back to you on that argument. Uh, um, uh, Joseph Amenio is a public relations officer of the Ghana House of uh, Port Agents. He's also an agent. Thank you, Joseph, for your time. So have you begun experiencing the reduction in the benchmark values of imports? Um, yes. Um, first and foremost, I would like to greet um, all viewers and all listeners who were listening to us this evening. Um, like you're saying, we, we are already experiencing it, and this is no fallacy, this is no lie. It's happening live, and it's really true. All what our vice president told us is, is really working. There is no doubt about it anywhere. Mm, so what kind of goods are we seeing this uh, impact on? Uh, can you come again? Please? What kind of goods are we seeing this impact on? What kind of goods are we seeing this impact on? Right. Oh, um, for the growth, um, I think it's, 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 it's a lot because if we are to look at the marketing aspect of uh, the duties concerning our country, I think it has, it has value on so many things that are going on in this country. And if um, it's coming down for all citizens, so I should say, the end user to be able to purchase stuff that... Uh, we are not able to manufacture in this country or we are not able to produce in, in this country. I think it's, it's really going to bring a lot of good first to our market, second, uh, even to the nation, and third, even to our job, because the import rate has really gone down when um, the Sydney lost its, its value. And with this sort of depreciation on it, it's, it's, it's really going to enhance our business and it's really going to boost the company. Okay, so for you as importers and agents, uh, what we're seeing is that there's going to be a lot more profit for you. There's going to be a lot more savings for you. But the multi-million dollar question is, for the final consumer, are they going to see a reduction in prices? Um, yes. Uh, it, it's obviously going to take place because um, this initiative, I don't think it was meant for the agent, neither was it meant for the importers, but it was, uh, the focus itself was on uh, the country as a whole, because uh, if things are in this country and they are so expensive and the country is not bringing uh, or making enough money for us to be purchasing things that are brought here, I think uh, the end users won't be able to purchase. So in this category, looking at where this thing is going to affect, is rather going to bring more good than any harm to this country. There's not an advantage to we as in, uh, agents in the port leaders. We're going to only bring uh, advantages to the economy, but also it's going to bring a very good productive, um, I should say, system for the whole country. Uh, it, it's really a very great initiative the government really took. Mm, all right. Uh, I've got to say a big thank you to you. Uh, thank you, um, Joseph Amenio, uh, for your time and for joining us in, in, on the phone lines. Uh, so, yeah, mm. you were talking about, um, bef before we went uh, f for Noah, I was asking about, you know, the, the belief that this is going to lead to a lot more imports. Yes, the import will increase short term, medium term. But I'm saying the counter to this is to see what we can do to help the exporters. For example, at like GEPA, right? We identify some industries that we need to help to promote the export. But even if I'm going to do the export, remember some of the input from these exporters also require to them, say, machinery, for example, if they're saving on the duty, that also help their operation. So, but let me take rice. I'm of the opinion personally that regardless of WTO and all of those stuff, we have to start taking care of our own in our own as a country. Nigeria under Obasanjo, mm -hmm. with a population of nearly 50 billion people, was able to ban the importation of poultry. Yes. Why can't we just take that decision? <laughs> we should. We should be bold enough to take some items that we, especially if we're doing the same item here. I take rice. We can do perfume rice. We can do 2%, 3% broken. We can do anything. But the ones producing it, we should give them whatever it takes so they can increase their production so that we, we will save more. Let's say if we have to put in $100 million to the rice industry to make more than we can need and then even excess to export. 
look at what we will say. The 100 million will mean that we won't need the 700 million that we import here. So if the net gain is, say, uh, 300 million after taking care of the right, that's savings to the country. That's foreign exchange that we don't have to send out. Let me ask you a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you answer this, but you make it sound so simple. But some have said that this is going to be a tough political decision that some of the movers and shakers of the economy are big time importers who contribute to political parties. Will you be able to look into their faces and say we are banning the imports of sugar, banning the imports of rice, banning the imports of poultry? <laughs> What's more important, the country as a whole or the individual? But we've never done it. What's, well, that's always the first time. Well, we never done that. As, as chairman we're doing of the it. Ghana Export Promotion Authority, yes. what would be the biggest legacy you'd want to leave? That our export increases three times. Whatever means that it takes, whether it's from cashew that we want to promote, okay? Ivory Coast does about 800 metric tons a year. It's the number one producer of cashew. We're next door. We do about 70,000 metric tons. We were saying that over the next 10 years, we want to do about 400 thousand but we could do better than that so what would it take for us to do that so we have some complement to cocoa even shea butter everybody wants shea butter in the world and shea butter is used in so many ways in making chocolates in all kinds of ways so what is it that we're doing so that we can take three or four or five good items okay and then blow it up not until we do that then we'll be back to the same thing i'm of the opinion that if we worried about other people like we will never take that decision to be bold and do these things. So if we reduce the tariff, we, the benchmark, let's look at some of the other things that we can do big and bold that will also help our local manufacturers. I mean, some incentives have been done, stimulus package and all of that. Let's blow it up. Let's make it bigger. Let's make it more meaningful so that we can feel the impact of these kind of decisions. Say if it takes two, three, four, five years, we can wait. At least so far as we're working towards it, that's the way we have Where to do Where do we do. start from? Where do we start from? I think we started with this 5%, so I'm looking forward to the next incentive. Some have said the flat 50% rate on all items is a bit unreasonable, that we should review it to look at Why? specific items. Why? I don't know. Why would they say that? Why would they discriminate on that? It's 50% benchmark reduction. So that will... Remember I said that if you reduce it, then it's going to supply and demand will come in. Prices will come down because if I want your business and say we bring the same thing in and I pass this saving on. For you say for something that I sell at 10 CDs, maybe I might be able to sell at nine, nine CDs, 50 pesos. Mm. So if you sell yours at 10, mm. okay, and people know that we have the same, they will come to me. So that, that brings some competition into the system, which will benefit the consumer. Mm. So as we go for it, I, I like this idea because I believe in the multiplier effect in anything. Mm. So whatever savings that we have from this uh, benchmark reduction, it's going to translate to so many things that you can only judge after maybe a year or so, mm. okay? If I'm able to save money, chances are I can increase my production. Chances are I might need more em employees. So, so individually, you might see maybe my increase your employee by one, but collectively, if we can increase employment by, say, 10,000 people because of this policy, that's a plus for the country. Mm. Mm. So uh, I also believe that corruption and cheating, this should help stop it, some. In the past, I bring my goods here and the benchmark is 100,000, so in the past I might go and make it 20,000. 20, 20, yeah. mm. Now, if the benchmark has reduced it to 50,000, is it worth it to go through all the challenges of paying people on the side just so you can save. Now, mm. the reduction is enough to motivate me that let me do my right thing and pay my bills and yeah, save it was, the country. I agree. It was because of the, the corruption, mm. and, and, and that, that was the reason this benchmark was bought. So, for instance, people go and buy cars that, you know, have uh, accident cars. They bring them, and, and probably they, are, they, are, they, co they cost about $5,000. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the benchmark is some, some, sometime around $10,000. So, you realize that the, that the taxes they are paying on the accident vehicle is probably even more than the price they purchase the vehicle. Yes. And that was one of the challenges for importers. Yes, but, but well, the way that I see, what you're saying is true, but the way that I look at it is that we all have been crying that the uh, duties are too high. Mm. Okay, mm. that's fine. I'm even glad to know that they're looking at the individual portion of the type to see if they can even do more. Right. You, other countries, US, what do you pay when you export? Almost mm. nothing. Mm. Okay, so right. China, everybody can do their business mm. there. Here, mm. look at West Africa here. It's even difficult to try to sell your things in Nigeria because you're not competitive. Mm. 
price wise. Mm. So if this will help make it so, mm. then why not? Mm. I think we should end with uh, your, what you do your Mondays as the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, well, and and what you've said that it is it should be possible for us to produce enough to be able to even export. What commodity, in your own estimation, can we begin to look at? We have a, we've been working on a national strategic uh, development plan. We had one that uh, was to take us through 2020. It was never, the recommendation were never implemented again, money. Uh, there was no money to uh, take some of these decisions. We were advised by the ministry to do an updated one, but this time we were incorporating the 10-point industrialization plan of the government. So the new one will come out, or there will be some specific recommendation, and we're going to make sure that we find what it takes to do that. For example, you take cashew. I've told you about it. Mm -hmm. I heard the cashew uh, team, the people on radio this morning, and uh, earlier we wanted to establish a cashew uh, board separately. But I understand now it's being chained to tree plant strategy. I don't agree with that. I think if it's cashew, let's make it a cashew board mm -hmm. to compete with cocoa board. Okay, cashew is a huge, the price is almost the same as cocoa per ton. Mm -hmm. So if we do it that way, and last year we did, uh, Ghana Export did a lot of uh, interventions by doing mass spraying. That alone increased uh, production by about 30%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we exported 262 million. 2017 we 2017 2018 we're hoping that if we can bring this up to about let's say about 600 million in three years that's good for the country mm -hmm. okay there are other uses of cashew that we're not exploring like the fruit you can make so many things ethanol mm -hmm. you can make uh, juices out of it so these are some of the value addition that we talk about mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's all talk. Mm. But if there's not incentive for the guy doing it to do those, mm. all these things, we won't go anywhere. Right. Look at coconut, for example. There's a huge demand for coconut in the world. Coconut oil is big in everywhere else. And we're doing some intervention with them. But remember that Gepa doesn't have all the resources to be able to, right. be, to take the bold step to do what it does. Right. We have to depend on some uh, 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 money from Ghana Exim to do what mm. we do. But right. these are some of the things I think the bold decision that if there's GEPA to promote export. What does it need to actually feel the effect of GEPA doing its job? Right. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sandy Osajimain. Uh, as the uh, board chairman of the Ghana Export Promotion Authority, uh, we discussed um, the mandate of the authority as well as the recent announcement uh, by the vice president for reduction in the benchmark uh, values of imports. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Thank Good you. to You're see welcome. you in the studio. All right. This is Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. We're also streaming live on Facebook. We'll take a short break. When we return, we've got the mover segment. We've also got some analysis on the stock market uh, plus the commodities market all coming your way. Hi, good evening and welcome to the Mover segment on Business Focus. I'm Eben Ejekun Boateng. My quest to look for a young entrepreneur to interview has taken me to Community One, Tema. Let's go in there to talk to a co-owner of Spectra Global. <laughs> good evening. Good evening and welcome to Spectra Global Limited. Thank you and how are you? I'm great. Right. I'm great. So let's go in and see what you have for us. Awesome. So where are those big tables, <laughs> big drawing <laughs> sheets? Um, those are prehistoric. Wow. They... I'm traditional. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't work with big tables and big T squares yes, and where you have to basically lie on the table to, for, for you to draw. We don't do it. It's over 20 years we ago. We call those guys draftsmen. Uh -huh. So what's the difference between what they do and what you do here? Okay, so the, usually when people ask me this question, I just bring it to something that they, they know quite well, like the difference between a medical doctor and a nurse. The difference between an architect and um, a car technician or a draftsman, as um, you call it, is one, even in the training, okay? Architects take six years of school time to train and we are given education on every aspect of the built environment, okay? A car technician takes maximum two years of training. And secondly, um, the level of understanding of an architect. An architect does more than drawing lines and um, 
buildings okay so what we do is we have we have understanding of what the architectural requirements and code of, of ethics and um, building regulations and everything are we also have understanding of the work of the engineers because as an architect you are on top of all the various allied professionals so you are working with structural engineers you are working with mechanical engineers you are working with electrical engineers you are working with quantity surveyors you are working with interior designers and you have to know what they are all supposed to do so that if they are making a mistake on the project, since you be the one to be held finally um, liable, you are supposed to be able to tell when they are going off so you can bring them back on track. Okay, a, car a, a draftsman cannot do that. Another difference is the level of complexity of projects we can handle. Do you get disappointed when you drive through town and you see some Why? of the structures? Uh, Definitely. Definitely. Why, why, why do you get disappointed? Because it, it can be way better. It can be way better in terms of um, just the, even the aesthetic appeal. And sometimes even when you go into um, these buildings, what the inside looks like, um, not just in terms of the beauty, but in terms of the functionality. The things like thermal comfort, things like um, in, in functionality of the spaces and so on and so forth. It can be better. People will talk about cost, so yes. they want to go to the wayside and just give a few notes to someone to draw for them. Yes. So how do you convince people that to put up a good building, the one that is safe and have that comfort, you have to look for an architect. Great. What we do is beyond lines. Before an architect we even design, uh, in quotes, a simple house for you, they will have to sit down with you and do a diagnostic interview with you. Who are you? What is your family like? What is your day-to-day -day routine like? Where do you work? Where, location, where, of the land. location of the land. What does the land come with? They will go to the site and find out. Sometimes you go to the site and just by mere view of what is on the land, you know that, uh-uh, this is trouble. How many workers do you have? Um, we are about 20 now. 20? Yes. That's, that's good. So let's go around and see what some of them are doing. So yes, Moses is a car technician. So presently what Moses is working on is the um, technical drawings of a project that we have that has been designed. So the architect does the concept and so on and so forth and they pass it on to the car technician who now details it out. So what is he doing? Francis, he is an architect and he is working on um, another project. He's inspecting drawings that have been completed by a car technician. So before any drawings go out, it comes back to the architect and then he crosses the T's and dots all the I's to make sure that whatever it is that was in mind is what is, what is going out. You talk in as if everything is easy. <laughs> um, what have been some of the challenges in doing this business? Who? Some of the challenges in doing this business. Um, the, one, one of the challenges is, is the mindset of the people where they don't even approach you because in their minds you're expensive so they won't even ask. Another challenge we face in the industry is the fact that people who have good projects to work on in the country somehow think that Ghanaian architects are not up to it so they go and bring in um, designers from South Africa, from everywhere else in the country, when we are all right here. So what I'd like to say is that um, they should give us a chance. We be it institutions, be it local business people, they should give us a chance. We know what we are doing. We are in this environment, we have been well trained and we understand what it takes. We have the creativity that it takes. Uh, this industry is male dominated. So what was the driving force? For you getting into into it i think even the mere fact that it was male dominated was interesting to me because i remember when i um, i said that i wanted to do architecture every tom dick and harry was like karen this is a man's thing number one it's difficult even the course you may not be able to finish it and architecture students don't sleep they don't do this i mean i was like oh, okay that's quite challenging so i went in so you have a lot of people watching you now what advice would you give to them, especially those who want to start their own business? I would say that master the craft. And, and, and the craft has to be good, the product has to be good. The skill that you are going out there with should be baked, it should be well honed. 
Uh, thank you, Karen Evans Ham. You're most welcome. Uh, you've been watching Mover segment on Business Focus. My name is Evan Ejekumbuati. All right, you're welcome back to Business Focus, your most authoritative business and economic analysis program live here on TV3. My name is Parker Sierra. I've just been joined in the studio by Winslow Saki Few, uh, who's with First Bank Financial Services. Uh, he's just, just joined us for the very latest on the stock market as well as the commodities market. Winslow, I understand there's, very, uh, there's some very interesting happenings on the Ghana Stock Exchange. Uh, we're talking of a sell off. Yes. What's that? Okay, so in a sell off, you have the sellers dominating the market and they do so in significant volumes. So last week, what we saw was that there were a lot of people who wanted to sell. The buyers were few, so they had to drop their prices and sort of triggered more selling. So for last week, we didn't get any gainers because most people wanted to sell. So the prices that buyers were willing to buy were lower. Why would people want to sell? I it's the confidence they have in the stock market going forward. And you know, the stock market is more of a leading indicator. So it tells investors what to expect going forward. And it looks like outlook for them is not so good. So they are trying to get out of the market. And it's a bit of a concern because two weeks before that, we saw a recovery in the market. So the market started picking up. And it looks like there's been a sudden dip, which might affect sentiment going forward. Mm. And how does this likely impact on the entire market? Yeah, so what we we'll see is normally uh, selling pressure is very contagious. So if you see a sell-off happening, it will trigger more sell-off until we get to the very bottom of the market and then the stock will start picking up again. Yeah, wow. And now it's difficult to know the bottom because there's a lot of negative sentiment on the market. And maybe third quarter we might see some recovery but for the second quarter i don't think we'll see a very wow, good market. wow interesting quick let's just go through the commodities market uh, what are the prices looking at uh, commodities uh, crude unfortunately we have hit the 70 dollar mark mm. you know it's sort of uh, a sentimental market point mm. because uh, demand data is expected to go up uh, saudi arabia unfortunately has decided to cut production and Venezuela too is having issues, so their production is not that much. So those of us here, it's likely the pump prices will go up because we are at the $70 mark and it's likely will go up because U.S. demand too will pick up going forward. Mm. For gold, uh, China, demand in China has increased. You know, China is the biggest consumer of bullion. So price has gone up and in India too, there was a sudden pickup in the demand. So that's leading to more of a price positive price change for bullion which mm. is gold mm. for cocoa uh, the story is not too good uh, if you're a farmer you get the prices going up for you but you can't produce that much because the weather is not so good they expected the rains to come in but the quantity of rainfall is not enough to lead to a proper harvest for them so we we'll see production falling but prices will go up because the supply will be lower mm. thank you very much Winslow for your time uh, that's it for business focus uh, today on TV3 my name is Parkwesi Asari thanks very much for watching God willing same time next week we'll come your way with yet another edition of your favorite program business focus your most authoritative business and economic analysis program life here on TV3 thanks very much for watching uh, coming up next is news 360 with Alfred Okante and Natalie Fort